Once again, we welcome you to our program, Polygamy, What Love Is This? My name is Doris Hansen, and I'm the host for your program, and we do talk about polygamy here. The purpose of our program is to discover as much information as we can about early Mormon and also present-day polygamy, and to talk about it and to, uh, to not hide it under the rug or hide it or disguise it, but to discuss it. We also want to apply biblical principles to the question of polygamy. Was it or is it God's plan uh, of salvation? I was born and raised in a local polygamy group and I have faced many of the challenges and the fears and the troubles and I've also enjoyed the victory of leaving it behind me. But best of all, I've had the privilege of discovering the truth for myself, of being able to make my own decisions and my own choices and to be able to form my own opinions. I discovered to my delight that polygamy is not included in God's salvation plan. Jesus Christ is the Savior. There is no other plan on this planet, and there is no work other than the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross to pay for our sins that will add to or help along with our salvation. Jesus is the one who saves our souls. This is a live broadcast from Salt Lake City, Utah, and a telephone call-in program. Uh, we will later on open up the telephone lines for you to call in. Uh, right now, I just have a few things I need to tell you about the program. First of all, we'd like to remind our polygamist viewers to go to the website shieldandrefuge.org. That's shieldandrefuge.org. And there's information there about polygamy, about polyg uh, biblical polygamy. One reason that the polygamy groups are able to keep their members is because they tell them that it's God's will and God's requirement for salvation. But if you go on there and read some of those articles, you'll find that that really isn't true. There's also a page where you can find uh, stories of people who have been born and raised in polygamy groups, that have left, and they have found that there is life after polygamy, that there's abundant, joyful life, and uh, you are invited to give that a try as well. Uh, a safe exit can be provided <clears throat> and everything that you would contact us about from that web page would be held in the strictest of confidence. This is a live call-in program, like we mentioned. Our telephone number is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. This program is designated uh, especially for the polygamous people, and we have noticed that there really aren't a lot of people calling from polygamy groups that they have identified themselves as the same. And we're a little concerned about that and wondering if perhaps the reason you're not calling in is because you're afraid. I know there's a lot of fear in polygamy groups. And uh, we know that there might be fear that you would be recognized, that your voice would be rec recognized if you called in. And so we are asking you a question. If we were able to scramble your voice, te technologically scramble your voice, would you call in? Would we have more response from the polygamous community? And this is what we'd, we, you can email us at tv at aboutpolygamy.com and give us your answer to that. But we really do want to hear from the polygamists to hear your questions, your comments, and your concerns about your group. Our webpage is aboutpolygamy.com. That's aboutpolygamy.com. You can go there and see previous shows. Uh, if you know someone that's outside of the viewing area, they can go there and watch any program that we've already produced. There's also future programming there, and you can go see what we have in store. And again, our email address is tv at aboutpolygamy.com. We would like you to email us. We want to hear what you're saying, what you're thinking about the program, and any suggestions that you would like us to cover in the future, we're asking you to email us. Uh, next, uh, next week, and probably more often in the future, we're planning on having some panel discussions. Uh, and so we would like you to email us your suggestions of what topics that you would like to have covered in our panel discussion. So give us a, an email, uh, tv at aboutpolygamy.com. Our guest tonight <clears throat> is a former member of the Kingston Polygamy Group, the same group that I was born and raised in. Um, the legal incorporated name for this group was the Davis County Cooperative Society. It was nicknamed the Order or the Co-op, and many people still refer to it as that. I mentioned that I mentioned this because in the name it helps to describe the doctrine of many polygamy groups, which in a word is the United Order or Communal Property. 
Many of our viewers may not know that the United Order was a pet doctrine of the early Mormon Church. It was introduced into the Mormon Church by Joseph Smith and it came full circle through Brigham Young, although it was never lived 100% by the membership. However, many polygamy groups live it and they do live it 100%. Mormon um, elder Marion G. Romney of the Council of the Twelve Apostles in the April 1966 conference made this remark. Quote, one time the prophet Joseph Smith was asked a question by the brethren about the inventories they were taking. His answer to the effect was, you don't need to be concerned about the inventories. Unless a man is willing to consecrate everything he has, he doesn't come into the United Order. And this was from the Documentary History of the Church, Volume 7, page 412 and 413. Now, Marion G. Romney maintained that political socialism or political united order is unsafe, but religious united order is okay. However, that is a smokescreen. Listen again to what Joseph Smith said. Unless a man is willing to consecrate everything he has, he does not come into the united order. Consecration was a requirement to become a member of their church and is currently a requirement for many polygamy groups. Consecration in their definition and application is that each member is to sign over their property and their money to the leadership, supposedly to be used equally by all. However, it has never worked out that way. Neither in political communism nor religious united order never has it been equally distributed and equally used by all. Now stay with me on this and it's all going to be tied together. It so happens that all the groups that embrace the United Order doctrine claim to be the only true church. So when Joseph Smith said that all those who join this only true church are required to consecrate everything they have, he is saying that those who do not do this will not enjoy the saving graces of the only true church. Therefore, it becomes a condition of salvation. Marion G. Romney decried political united order, but he embraced the religious united order, and there really isn't much difference. Political force is external obedience by the threats of man or government. Religious force is obedience by mind control and the threats of God and eternal damnation which is infinitely more dangerous and toxic. The basis for this united order so-called command comes from Acts chapter 4 where the new Christians had sold their property and brought the proceeds to the leadership to share with the poor. Now although this was a very good thing to do, a, certainly a Christian thing to do, you can read the whole chapter 4 of Acts and you will never see that it was ever a command by God. They chose to do this because they wanted to help people. And uh, unfortunately, it's the polygamy groups will do with this just like they did with the polygamy doctrine. They find things in the Bible where so-called righteous people did something and they'll take it and they'll twist it and call it a command from God and make it a condition for salvation. Nowhere in the Bible has God ever commanded a religious group or any person to give to a religious group all of their money and all of their property. It just isn't in there. God never set up a united order society. For a group to require this gives them total control of you, gives them total control of your life and your family, and is yet another false condition for salvation, and it is not from God. Well, tonight I'd like to introduce our guest to you who is from the Kingston Group who lives the United Order to a T. The Kingston Group does that very well. They believe and they practice it. Our guest is Elaine Peterson. Uh, she was raised in the group. Her family was um, practiced polygamy. In fact, she and her husband practiced polygamy uh, for a short time, but it ended uh, being very hurtful and harmful to everybody. So Elaine, we want to welcome you for being here. Thanks for, for coming and we just hope you're calm, cool and collected <laughs> right now. 
<laughs> well, thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we, d we know that you have an interesting story, mm -hmm. and we know that Elaine has some astute opinions about dangerous mm -hmm. and controlling grip that polygamy groups have and do exert on their members. So uh, we do want to hear your story. Uh, if you want to just start kind of from the beginning, and then we'll just talk about it as you go along, if okay. that's, it works for you. Sounds good. <laughs> Um, I have to back up just a little bit because for some of these questions tonight, I need a little bit more background before my time. <laughs> it, my, when my mother, my mother was first married in the group to the leader, and she ended up leaving him and marrying my father, so I wasn't born there. I, I think she came back when I was about 18 months old or two years. <clears throat> she came back to the group after? She came back to the group. Did uh -huh. she bring your father with? No. No, um, he did work for the group for a while, but um, never because in that group, men can't really come into the group. Only women <laughs> <laughs> keeps the bloodline pure. Yeah, right. Uh huh. <laughs> but she, so she came back and um, she brought five little girls with her, and um, I. So I, I kind of grew up there. You know, Why the majority of my life. Back? My father, um, he was a good dad, but he turned to drugs and alcohol oh my. severely. And so she felt like to save her children, the only place she had to go was home. So she went home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she went back. And um, so I, I grew up there. I went to Sunday school there. I, di I didn't know any other way, you know. You were fully indoctrinated by the group then, yes. what, what, what they taught and what they believed. And mm -hmm. Did you expect to be married into a polygamous family as you grew older? Was that something they taught you would be doing? M me and my friends would actually, I remember sitting out at, at the farm that the group owned, one of them, and we would talk about how we wanted to be the second or third wife, and not the first because we felt like we would get more blessings and, hmm. you know, <laughs> so we were preparing ourselves. Mm -hmm. to go into polygamy. And you almost make it into a romantic kind of yeah. dream that young uh -huh. girls that don't know any better <laughs> would do. <laughs> so yeah. so you, when you grew older then, uh, you were able to marry someone who wasn't already married. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and But you got married at a very early age, didn't you? I did. How old were you? I, I was 15 years old. 15? A month away from 16. Wow. I have a daughter that is that exact age right now. So you're ha and double her age then? Yeah. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked about that today. I asked her if she thought she would be ready to be married right now, and she said, no, hmm. no way. Well, how can a child get married, um, actually be a mother and, and a good wife, and they're just a child yet themselves? It, it was hard for me. I felt more mature than a lot of the 15-year-olds my age. Mm -hmm. But I really noticed when I was 21, I was a much better mother than I was at, 15, at 16. Because mm -hmm. I had my first at 16, and then I had my third by the time I was 21. So you had three <coughs> children by the time you were 21 years old? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Um, we discussed a little bit before the show kind of the things that were on your heart that you wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. One of the things you wanted to discuss was how they teach you to trust the group instead of Jesus mm -hmm. for salvation and how you've kind of turned that around. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you like to explain that? Um, the, the, how, how it impacted you when you discovered that the group wasn't the way to salvation but that Jesus alone. Was. Right. Well, I when I was in the group, I felt like I was doing everything right. I was not sinning at all. And I was going to make it to heaven for sure if I died. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't until I left that I realized that, that I am a sinner and that I need God's grace. And so and it, it, not a group of people wasn't going to take me mm -hmm. to Him. Mm -hmm. I had to go to Him. And so that was that was an eye-opener for me. A lot of people that I speak with that have left polygamy groups will say, or even any other controlling religion group, will say, uh, I thought he was a group God, that he was mm -hmm. God only of this group, and the saving graces mm -hmm. were only there. And mm -hmm. I realized he found out he was a personal, right. personal Savior rather right. than a group Savior. That was mm -hmm. very special, uh, to, precious to me when I discovered that. Well, I started to wonder when I was 
it took me a couple of years to get the knowledge that I needed to walk away. But I started to wonder um, if God created so many people and only this small group was going to be saved, then is the God that I believe in a wasteful God? Because why would he create so many people just to let them fall by the wayside? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. Now your mother came back to the group mm -hmm. and she had five young girls. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she left, she divorced her husband, is that what she did? Mm -hmm. And then came back into the group. Mm -hmm. And did she practice plural marriage after she came back in? She did. Mm -hmm. She went back into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not with the same person that she was with. With uh, She met a really neat guy and came back with him. Oh, I see. Okay. And so what happened to your father, your natural father? He, he ended up going out of state for a while. He was around for a few years and then he left. Mm -hmm. did, so did you have contact with him often? or uh, we, we did in the beginning and then he left. Yeah. So. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, you had an eye-opener verse that you like to talk about, which uh, has, is a very mm -hmm. good verse. Uh, in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to talk about that and apply it to your experience in the Kingston group? I would. Well, I didn't read the New Testament until after we had left um, the group. Uh -huh. I had always read the Book of Mormon and the Pearl of Great Price and the Doctrine and Covenants. And <clears throat> so this was, a, was an eye-opener for me. It's Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But through, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. And what did that do to you when you read that? Um, I thought of a verse that I had read, or I don't know if it's a verse, but something that happened to Joseph Smith on plural marriage. The comment, um, <coughs> mm -hmm. yeah, and I have that here, the Journal of Discourses, volume 20. Uh, the prophet Joseph Smith said, when the principle was revealed to the prophet Joseph Smith, he did not falter, although it was not until an angel of God with a drawn sword stood before him and commanded that he should enter into the practice of that principle or he should be utterly destroyed or rejected that he moved forward to reveal and establish the doctrine referring to plural marriage. Um, it makes you wonder where the free agency went on that one, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Yes, and I'd seen that when I read that, then I thought of that verse that I had read about Joseph Smith. Uh huh. And it really hits you hard because you think, boy, what, you know, what if he wouldn't have listened? <laughs> you know, if that happened to him, what if he wouldn't have listened? And so much heartache could have been avoided it could have. from that, you know. Yeah, it could but have. just reading the New Testament, so much heartache yeah. and could be avoided. Mm -hmm. It, sh it so. could, just obeying that. So you, uh, you were married into the polygamy group and you started a family. Um, tell us about when you and your husband... Um, I guess were pressured into mm -hmm. living polygamy? Um, not, not necessarily pressured, but it's a way of life. Uh -huh. And you feel that if you don't live that way, you won't have your family in heaven. You won't have your husband. You won't make it to the celestial kingdom if you don't live that way. And so it, it's your goal to live that way. And the men go after it. And a lot of men go after it wholeheartedly. And then when they live it, they really regret that they did that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so true. You know. That's true. And did that happen so, with your husband? It did. It did. And with you. Mm -hmm. How did that make you feel when your husband, you'd, how old, how long had you been married? When we had he been married for one? nine years. Wow. And then what did he that took do another you? one. You know, in the beginning, I just, when I had human feelings of loneliness and sadness, I just, you know, from what I had been, trained to think and raised to think it was Satan trying to discourage me to you know trying to get to me so that I wouldn't make it to the celestial kingdom mm. and you know through the years I just thought why would God hate women so bad that he would want us to be lonely all the time and to be sad and to you know have those feelings which 
it wasn't God. It was the consequence of living a sinful That's life. So right. Mm -hmm. If we're if we're not living a sinful life, then we don't have those feelings. We're happy, you but know. But they teach you that the feelings of jealousy when your husband's mm -hmm. in bed with another woman, that that feeling of jealousy is wrong. Right. And yet, clear back in Genesis chapter three, mm -hmm. uh, God still told Eve her desire would be for her husband. He right. built that into us right. to be jealous of our husband. Right. And, uh, and, and that's a natural emotion mm -hmm. that is not wrong to have. Right. And you have, when two people get together, they can become as one, but when three get together, they can't become as one. They There's, can't be one. As, because I was a first wife, so I have, so I know what it was like to just have him uh -huh. to myself. And once he, once he remarried, you know, got married to his second wife, then we didn't have that closeness that we had before. Mm -hmm. We, you know, you can't share certain things. So there's a wall. And have you ever got that closeness back? At no. The, your polygamist. Um, Try it. Polygamy failed. Yeah. And uh, and you never received that closeness back. Never. Something lost. I had an aunt tell me before we lived that way, hers had her situation had dissolved, and she told me she says no matter what, no matter how many years you're together, after you live that way, you will never feel that closeness again. So because polygamy. there will always be something else there. Polygamy is not a blessing. No. It is not a blessing. I'd like to remind our viewers that we do have a, a telephone call-in program here, and if you want to call in at 973-8820, we will be opening the phone lines in a few minutes. If you want to call in now and hang on so you can be the first one in, feel free to do so. Um, it'll be a few more minutes yet before we start answering calls. Um, tell us about your personal freedom that you have found in Christ and your family freedoms as a result of having left the group compared to the control that they had mm -hmm. of you and your family while you were in the group. One of the biggest freedoms that I have is the freedom from fear. The, I don't fear anymore. I grew up under intense fear all the time. In my whole life, I feared everything. And I wanted to raise my kids so they wouldn't have that fear. Uh -huh. They're very outspoken and strong. <laughs> Um, but once I discovered Christ and my relationship with Christ, then the fear was gone. And um, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, it says, Perfect love casteth out fear. And so I had to find the perfect love. And God's love fear. is perfect, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. And no group can can do no. that for you. In fact, the group itself instills the fear. Mm -hmm. they, they make you afraid to even make your own decisions and choices. It does. Well, you can't, because you can't live the laws of the land a lot of times, then you have to live in fear mm -hmm. all the time. Well, they, they raised, at least in us, I don't, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure about it, when it was where you were being raised, but we were always grilled, don't say this and mm -hmm. don't say that, and if you do and, and we mm -hmm. get in trouble, you'll go to hell. And all. So mm -hmm. they grill fear, fear into you, they drill it into you. My fear was being removed from my home, being taken away from my mother. They threatened us too. You know, and mm -hmm. I, because my grandmother wasn't a part of the group, my dad's mom, then I had to lie to her mm. about who my stepdad was and mm -hmm. and that was hard. And one time I made a mistake and slipped just a little bit and I was so afraid that the wrath of God would come down onto me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. But it didn't, I, you know. I can understand that. We were the same way with our dad, mm -hmm. you know, with our father. I don't think he's really a dad to us, but um, you're, um, you made the remark that uh, you wondered during, while you were suffering during this life in polygamy, mm -hmm. uh, what you had done in the pre-existence mm. that would cause you to be born into this miserable lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And then when you discovered the truth regarding the pre-existence, mm -hmm. you were quite, uh, quite delightfully surprised. Mm -hmm. you want to tell us that experience? Well, I, I grew up thinking that I must have done something so horrible in the pre-existence to receive the father that I did. And I couldn't imagine that I would have been in heaven saying, I'm so excited to <laughs> go down there and, and live this life, you know. <laughs> and 
um, when I, the first time I went into a Christian church, I had the opportunity of talking to the pastor. We had a lengthy discussion, and he showed me in the Bible where it said that, that our spirit was created in our mother's womb. Mm -hmm. and, and I had had dreams about certain kids that I'd had, you know, and they, um, and I thought, well, how could that be possible? And he says, well, God knew what he was creating from the very beginning, mm -hmm. and he can let you know through certain things like that, you know. And so I didn't do anything wrong. I wasn't a lesser person in heaven, you know, because I, I grew up thinking that God must not have really liked me. <laughs> <laughs> he sent me down, and, and uh, I was just an, an extra. Yeah, you just know. an extra. Uh, I think that pre-existence idea is so ingrained in us. Mm -hmm. uh, we're taught it from the cradle, of course. When I discovered that there wasn't a pre-existence, I, it was, <clears throat> I believed the Bible, mm -hmm. and it, it, it does not support the pre-existence myth, but mm -hmm. it was my, like my identity, mm -hmm. and I, it was so hard for me to let go. It was like part mm -hmm. of who I was, or who I thought I was, mm -hmm. and it took me quite a struggle to finally let go, and I finally just had to put it down and say, okay, Lord, you're going to have to work this out of me, because mm -hmm. that's what, but there mm -hmm. is no pre-existence. We didn't choose mm -mm. to be born in the polygamy group. We didn't choose to be born to our parents and, and to no. go through all this. Well, and then if you believe that you did, then you can be a martyr. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> but if you don't, then you can listen to what God is telling you and you can step forward. Uh -huh. And you can change your life and you don't have to live that way. Right. So How true that you wasn't is. chosen before to be miserable. Uh-uh. So. And you didn't choose to be miserable. No. I was taught, my mother taught me that we chose our parents, we chose our home, we chose to be born in the group, and, and mm -hmm. we were valiant, so we earned, to, earned it to do that. And I always wondered, why would I choose this? <laughs> uh, why would I choose? <laughs> I won't go into some of the yeah. gory details of that, but anyway. We have a call coming in from, Sa uh, from Diane, uh, from Sandy, and um, she wants to know, how did Elaine embrace true Christianity? Let's Hello, Diane, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, Diane, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, you had a question for Elaine. Yes, I do. Elaine, I have a friend who came out of polygamy, and then she um, joined mainstream Mormondom. And um, I, I've heard that this oftentimes happens. And I wondered from you, Elaine, how you came to enjoy and accept Christ as your Savior rather than going back into um, mainstream Mormondom. And I'll get off the phone so you can answer that. Thank you, Diane. Well, okay. this gives you a chance to tell your part Definitely. of the story Definitely. We actually joined the Mormon Church after we left. And um, in the area that we we did join the church. They are remarkable people. And it, to us it was kind of just, we did everything in steps. And for us to leave, because we had such a strong belief in Joseph Smith, that we, we were not ready to walk away from the, our beliefs. And we just wanted some beliefs where it was up to date. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Wasn't so hard, maybe, <laughs> but we so we did. We joined the Mormon Church, and we had a lot of help from the people in that religion. They were just amazing for us. Mm -hmm. And after two years and certain experiences there, I really had to start questioning. And it goes back to the early prophets of the church and the things that they taught and different things that they said that I believed to be law. And, and once I was away from the fundamentalist group, then I wasn't thinking that way anymore. I wasn't in that mindset. Mm -hmm. So I had to really evaluate. And I started reading the writings from Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. And I knew I had to leave. But I didn't want to say anything to my husband because I didn't want to ruin his testimony. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he went to Oregon with our boys, and he called me and said, we need to talk. And he was having these same feelings. Oh, okay. He came straight home. We met in Salt Lake. I was scared to death. I didn't know what he was, wanted to talk about. And he just told me, 
that he could not believe in this anymore. Mm. And I felt relief, you know, and wow. I, I didn't want to get involved with any other church at that time. And we were invited to go to a Christian church. And um, my, my husband, you know, he said, let's go, let's do it. And, and I thought, oh, I don't want to go, you know, they're probably fanatical people. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hang out with them. <laughs> and I ended up going, and just through the worship music, I, I just sat down, almost cried. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, it was the most wonderful feeling that I wasn't just singing, I was feeling. Mm -hmm. You were worshiping. Yes, exactly. And then my journey started when I went back home, because we lived in a different location. And I went back home and got involved with the Christian church down where we lived. And that's where I truly found Christ, mm -hmm. was there. Mm -hmm. And your so, husband, has he, um, has he come, come that far on his journey yet? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> and you're praying for him, oh, aren't you? Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Okay. Off the air question. Why does the state allow polygamy? Well, um, we had a, a show a couple of weeks ago with uh, Paul Murphy from the Attorney General's office, and that question was asked. Actually, we get that question almost every week, uh, but we did get it when Paul Murphy was here, and it's not so much that the state allows it, but um, how um, big of a job would it be? How, how much money and how much time and prison space and so on it would take to really uh, round up everybody that practices polygamy and put a stop to it, legally, lawfully put a stop to it. It'd be a very difficult thing to do. So we're trying to get, we're doing our little part here uh, to stop polygamy by trying to get the people to see and trying to help them to understand it's not God's will. And uh, we we believe that if there's enough people out there, especially the women who understand and can find out for themselves that God doesn't require this miserable lifestyle, that they'll get up and walk out. That's what we're hoping for. And we're hoping that we can help them do that. But we want them to study that out for themselves. We want them to read the Bible and to find out what God says about it. The state uh, they're trying to do their part in helping with the polygamy situation, but it is a big problem all throughout the state and other states as well. We remind you that our telephone number is 801-973-8820. Uh, our lines are open, so you can give us a call and ask your question either of myself or of the guest, Elaine here. So you talked about your, your overwhelming constant fear mm -hmm. that you experienced. Um, they use tools like guilt, fear, and shame mm -hmm. uh, to hold on to their people. And fear mm -hmm. is, is a big tool that they use. Mm -hmm. And I would have to agree with you that it was very awful. Do you think the fear was real or do you think it was a mind control technique? Oh, mind control. Started very young. I always feared that if I went into, uh, the people outside of the group we called outsiders. Mm -hmm. And I always feared if I went into their house after school, if I had a friend that was an outsider, then my mom would find out, you know, mm -hmm. and she didn't, you know, <laughs> and God didn't punish me, you mm -hmm. know, it's exactly. okay. So the fear started from the very beginning, and then you would hear stories of people that had left and bad things were happening, you know, maybe they got cancer, and there, it was always followed up with, you know, it's because they left, or if someone died in the group, then, well, they were paying the price for someone who had left. So there wasn't any bad things happen to good people. It was just, it was always paying a price for something you had done or mm -hmm. something somebody else had done. Let's talk a little bit about this. Um, you talked about that they would say that uh, somebody's sin w mm -hmm. would be being paid for someone else. Someone mm -hmm. else would suffer because you sin. Now, this mm -hmm. would be the case of a drunk driver or something like that. Mm -hmm. But to pay, put a religious uh, application to mm -hmm. that. Uh, well, my grandpa died when I was probably 10 or 12 years old and my mother mm -hmm. told me he died for my sins because mm -hmm. I was a sinner. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was really hard to take, mm -hmm. especially when I knew my grandpa had been sick for a long time. Mm -hmm. But that's, isn't that kind of the mindset that they have uh, to blame someone else for something that, who, who dies it for is. whose sins here? Well, when my husband went out to get our, our finances when we were leaving, I was so fearful that he was going to get into an accident. Mm 
Hmm. He wasn't going to make it home. And with every step that we took, that not anything happened, it made me stronger. Mm -hmm. When we were baptized into the Mormon church, I thought, you know, I told the Lord, I was, if you're upset with this, this is your chance to just run a semi into <laughs> us right now. <laughs> Stop Take us, us all out this. at once, you know, <laughs> and he didn't. Yeah. And so that gave me the courage to take more steps and, you know, and, and not live in fear anymore. Uh, we heard through the grapevine that when we left, we had a brother-in-law die, and we heard that he died because we left. He died because yeah. you left. Mm -hmm. And, and that again, really that's hurts. the guilt trip that they mm -hmm. like to put on people, and there's absolutely no biblical mm -hmm. basis for that kind of uh, uh, mm -hmm. application right. for that. That's wrong. Um, have you added, well, we talked about that. When you live inside this group, you, you um, are taught to obey the leaders mm -hmm. while you're thinking that you're attaining your salvation. Mm -hmm. um, they have some kind of a, um, a saying, one above another, mm -hmm. uh, obey your leaders and, and if they tell mm -hmm. you to do something wrong, you won't be blamed for mm -hmm. it. They will. You just obey and you'll be okay. Right. What do you think yeah. about that now that you're out of the group? What is your... Now that we're out, <laughs> it is so neat to not have to go to someone to ask where we can work, where we can live, who we can marry, who our children can marry. My daughter just got married to the man of her dreams mm -hmm. and she didn't have to ask anybody. He did come talk to Sean. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But, to, you know, and they can go to school where they want. They can go to school for what they want. There's none of that, you know, when we were there, every little choice wasn't our choice. If we wanted to move, we had to ask permission. Mm -hmm. If we wanted to build, you know, if you wanted a new job, anything that mm -hmm. you wanted, you had to ask permission. And if it wasn't what the leadership wanted, then it's something you didn't do. And if you went against so. the leadership in any way, then there was consequences. Right, consequences. which my husband started his own business. Yeah. And within a couple of years, there was a note left on our windshield that said we would have to pay more rent if we didn't work where we were told. <laughs> and the so. rent was paid to the group. Well, we were, we were right. already buying our house, uh -huh. so it would just be added onto the house. So you were paying so, rent besides your house payment? We were buying our house, yeah, so we'd have to pay rent for the land that the house was on. <laughs> so. Oh my so you couldn't make a choice like that without a consequence. And the, and the fear goes with that as well. And, right. and you also made a statement that about your daughter just marrying mm -hmm. uh, the man, her choice. Her choice. We had a guest on several weeks ago, um, and he said he was a young man, and he, mm -hmm. he got to choose his bride, and he says, mm -hmm. I got to write my own love story. Yes. And that's kind of what it mm -hmm. reminded me of. She got to write her own love story. Somebody did. else didn't tell her mm -hmm. who she had to marry, and and then mm -hmm. get into a relationship that was not loving. And she was 21. <laughs> and she had dated for about four years. <laughs> yeah, she, 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 was, she was, had a smart mother who was yeah. <laughs> convincing her here, right? Okay, we have an off-the-air question. Uh, how many people who are in polygamy has the Shield and Refuge helped? Well, I thank you for that question. Um, Shield and Refuge has helped several people. We don't give numbers. Uh, we cannot give numbers. We are held in strict confidence in all of the help that we do, but we have helped a lot of people leave, uh, adults as well as children, and we get calls. You would, uh, you would be amazed at how many calls and inquiries we, that we do get. Uh, people are afraid. They're afraid to step out. We know that, and we know that it takes a long time sometimes for someone to really make up their mind to go. But we patiently work with them and show them through the scriptures and pray for them. Uh, that they would understand that polygamy is not God's will. Uh, we do appreciate your question. Okay, Elaine, let's talk about uh, kind of a volatile issue. Maybe it was at least with you at one point. Um, most of the polygamy groups follow the mother church in the fact that they um, are prejudiced. And um, we were taught, and it didn't make much sense to me the way we were taught, but according to Brigham Young, Joseph Smith classified these people as the seed of Cain. 
Jo uh, this is what Brigham Young said. Joseph Smith had declared that the Negroes were not neutral in heaven for all the spirits took sides. Again, the pre-existence, which, which is not a reality anyway, mm -hmm. is at play in here. But the posterity of Cain, Cain are black because Cain murdered his brother Abel. He killed uh, Abel and God set a mark upon his posterity. Furthermore, the Bible doesn't say what the mark was on Cain. It doesn't say it was black skin. Uh, and so they kind of take a lot of liberties with the scripture here. But tell us your experience with the prejudice of the Kingston group. Well, because my father wasn't a member when I was born, he was never a member. Uh, when I was about 12, I was a young, at a young women's outing and I had some girls come up to me and some of them were my cousins and they asked if I could, if they could ask me a question. I said, sure, go ahead, and they know we have to go somewhere where no one will hear us. I said, okay, <laughs> let's go. So we went into the bathroom, and they said, we heard that you are part Negro. Is that true? And being raised in a group where it's not okay <laughs> to be part Negro, then I was really hoping the floor would open and swallow oh me. Oh my goodness, <laughs> that must have been devastating too. And I didn't understand it, but a couple of years ago, I was talking to my, one of my cousins and she said that she had heard her parents say that one of the leader's wives had dreamt that whoever left the leader would marry into black blood. And so basically when I came back so many people believed, or when my mother came back so many people believed that her five daughters were part Negro. And you know, it's such a blessing to me because I could have been raised really racist. <laughs> and I know what it feels like to not be invited to go water skiing with my uncle or be part of something because someone thinks that you they have think black that blood. Because you've got black blood. Isn't that awful? And that, um, oh, it's something that Brigham Young, did you, I don't know if you heard that. Oh, no. Something that Brigham Young wrote, and this is something that really, struck a chord with me when he said, shall I tell you the law of God in regard to the African race? If the white man who belongs to the chosen seed mixes his blood with the seed of Cain, the penalty under the law of God is death on the spot. This will always be so. This is in Brigham Young, Journal of Discourses, volume 10, page 110. Now, and another thing that's in the Journal of Discourses is that Brigham Young the second prophet of the Mormon church said that whatever he preached was as good as scripture. And to me, scripture stays the same. Mm -hmm. So I could not be part of something that was racist because of the way that I was raised. Mm -hmm. How and hurtful I, that is. Yes. How painful. And I was so blessed though. <laughs> I couldn't see it then, but I, I was so blessed. <laughs> and that's how it's been throughout my whole life is God has led me and, and things that looked like a bad situation really turned out good. So You have such a sweet spirit, <laughs> Elaine. It's, it's really wonderful and refreshing. Well, thank you. Uh, on the uh, prejudice issue, that was something that dogged me too, even into my adult years, until I really started doing my own Bible studies. And I came across the scripture, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. And it's the throne room in heaven where all of the redeemed are bowing down before the throne of grace. And it says in there that they have been redeemed to God by the blood of Christ out of every kindred, out of every tongue, out of every people, and out of every nation, which means that they're Everybody has a chance to get into heaven. It doesn't matter if you're blue or black or pink or plaid or polka dot. God has a flower garden down here and he also has one in heaven. So we don't have to worry about prejudice from God. He created all of us exactly. and he loves all of us equally. Okay, uh, we have an off the air question. How did Elaine recognize that she was a sinner and what led up to the discovery process? How long have you been a Christian? Mm -hmm. Let's see, since all three. Since all three, <laughs> yeah. so about five years. Yep. Okay. And in the Bible where it says, even if you call your brother a fool, then you have, you have shed innocent blood. You have committed a sin. Mm -hmm. And in God's eyes, all sins are the same. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that really, I mean, if you're driving down the street, you get mad at the guy in front of you. <laughs> Anger. <laughs> I can't You're make not. it through a day <laughs> without sinning, you know. So, uh, continual repentance and 
just knowing that God loves me and He forgives me. He, for, he can right. only forgive us, forgive us because of one event. Mm -hmm. If it wasn't for that event, He couldn't forgive us, and that's mm -hmm. the event of Jesus Christ on the cross. Right. Unfortunately, a lot of people in the, in the polygamy group think that God loves us, and so I'm going to go to heaven because mm -hmm. He loves me. But that's not true. God hates sin. Or that I do this and this and this, and, and I'll go to heaven. I will earn my way into heaven. Right, right. And you can't. Mm -mm. No, it's only because of Jesus. Actually, it's a gift. It's a gift mm -hmm. from God, and that's what this represents here on my table, a gift from God. That's what eternal life is. You cannot work for it. You cannot earn it. You cannot be good enough for it, and you don't get it just because God loves you. You receive mm -hmm. it as a gift from Jesus Christ who died on the cross to pay for your sin, and if you don't take the gift, you don't get it, and I just mm -hmm. hope and pray that you don't go into eternity without taking your gift. You can take that tonight. We have a call from Michael in Magna. Um, a pos he's a possible in a polygamous church has questions. Okay. Hello, Michael. Hi. Hello. How are you tonight? I'm doing pretty good. Kind of weird. I was uh, hearing you uh, on the phone late or before uh, on the TV. <laughs> have you turned your TV down? Yeah, I just now did. Okay. Okay. What's your question tonight? Well, my question is, um, first of all, I'm having some doubts. And... Um, Lately, uh, I've been having some severe health problems um, due to diabetes and epilepsy. Okay. And the leader of our group keeps telling us, or especially me, that uh, because I'm not living the law of consecration and living, uh, <clears throat> living all the laws and commandments, that I'm suffering these health problems, therefore. Really? Mm. And I was wondering if uh, there was any truth to it. Well, Michael, we all suffer um, mm -hmm. from physical problems and illnesses. And just because you're not doing the impossible doesn't mean that that's why you're sick. Uh, in the book of Acts, I believe it's chapter 15, the uh, disciples are talking about how the religious, how religion and religious leaders will place upon the backs of believers or uh, on the backs of their people commandments that cannot be kept. Uh, God has not required the commandments that most polygamy groups and most religions will put on their people. If you're sick, it's because there's something been, has gone wrong with your body, and it's not because you're not keeping the commandments of the polygamy group. Um, Michael, what uh, doubts are you having about your group? Um, well, like lately, uh, our leader's been saying that he's God. He's saying that he's the Holy Ghost and oh, yeah. all these other things. Um, and just a couple Sundays ago, he told everybody that... Uh, in the church that we need to take all our bills, we need to give all of our money, especially, um, to the church. And I'm on SSI, I've been on SSI since uh, 2002. And, you know, being told I have to give all my money, especially to the church, um, that's caused me to doubt there especially. That's a good doubt, Michael. I would love to help you. If you have you given your telephone number to the uh, to the answering person who answered the phone, I'd love to talk with you and go over some specific scriptures that talk to your situation. God does not require this from anybody. It's it's what I talked about at the beginning of the program. The United Order is not a command from God and you need to run, not walk, but you need to run from that kind of teaching. It's not a requirement. And I'm also afraid um, of leaving because I don't have any place to go. And well, you know, there's, there are options, and that's what I'd like to talk to you about. Um, would, you, would you want to uh, email us at, at our email address, tv at aboutpolygamy.com, or leave your phone number so that I can talk with you about these things? Because we can sure help you. I would love to leave my phone number. Okay. Uh, and I do appreciate your call. I really do want you to call us and talk to me because we can help you with all of these questions and with your dilemma. I sure appreciate it. And thank you for calling. Be sure and leave your phone number now. All right, I will. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michael. God bless.
Right. Bye. Bye. Uh, Valerie from West Valley. Hello, Valerie. Yes, hi. Hello, how are you tonight? I'm doing good. I called a little earlier. Hello? I called a little earlier and um, mentioned some journals of some of the original wives, like my great-grandmother and Anne, his 19th wife. But what I wanted to mention is um, the very first person who was a Gentile baptized that is listed in the New Testament was an Ethiopian eunuch. And he was baptized by an original apostle of Jesus Christ by the name of Philip, uh -huh. who was taken to his caravan. And after he joined uh, up with the uh, very important eunuch and helped him with the scriptures, and he went down and baptized that man uh -huh. and then was translated away. Uh -huh. So also... Um, and the Ethiopian eunuch would have been black, right? Cain could have ever survived <laughs> the flood. Right. So... You know, it's, it, the whole thing makes sense that any black man could be Cain at all. Well, that's exactly right because all of Cain's descendants uh, died in the flood. You're right. Yeah. Yeah, it's just something that mankind likes to put to, to rise themselves up above each other. And it is it is a deadly doctrine. It isn't good. Well, what the problem is, is in most of these, even Jim Jones, it's a, it's a man who wants so much power mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, because he says in his heart, if I was God... And then he starts a church, and it's the same doctrine that Satan has taught since he fell from heaven when he said in his heart, I will become I want God. to be like God, right. And, and uh, false religious groups all prove, or excuse me, all teach that you can, man can become a God, and it's a lie straight from Satan. Absolutely, because it's the very lie that got him cast out of heaven, and right. he's great anger. He wants to take all these guys with him. Right, absolutely right. Thank you, Valerie. We appreciate your, your call. Bye-bye. Uh-huh, bye. Okay, we have on line three, uh, Tobias from West Valley City. Hello, Tobias? Yes, hello. Yes, hi, how are you tonight? Pretty good. Hey, uh, I've read the Koran, and I've read the Christian Bible, and the last verse in Zechariah uh, seems to be racist to me. It says, it says, there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. And I want to get your take on that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. you, you might want to turn to it in your Bible. The last verse in Zechariah. There'll be no more, no more Canaanites. It appears in the to be a millennial scripture because it, it 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 appears millennial. All the bells on all the horses shall say holiness to the Lord, and there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. So a group of people uh, from do you know Canaan. Who, do you know who the Canaanites represent in the Bible? It's where the where the inhabitants of of the Palestinian area. In the early days of Abraham in Genesis, right? They were. Right? Okay. In that time, the Canaanites, and you, you'll read it in the book of Genesis, the Canaanites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hittites, and all these other ites were in the land that Abraham came to, in the land of Canaan. And they were so wicked that God gave them actually hundreds of years to repent and, and to uh, turn their, from their ways, and they never did turn. And so when a um, Canaanite is mentioned in the Bible, it's referring to people who are heathens, who are not following the one and only true God, who worship false gods and multiple Interpretation, gods. Interpretation, but the Canaanites are a race of people. The, the Canaanites... And it in, says in the, in the millennium, if you read the context of uh, Zechariah, it says, there shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Okay. The children is, of Israel were commanded it, not to, to marry the inhabitants of the, of the land, except for the daughters of Midianites they took to wife uh, once it was determined they were virgins. Uh, Tobias, God is not a racist, and uh, there is interracial marriage in the Bible. Uh, this is a moral question. If you get in the Bible and really study... Islam is not racist. There's all kinds of colors, oh. of different colors and races in Islam. But, but as I read the Christian Bible, uh, it, it, it shows to me that, that God uh, discriminates against various peoples uh, by, their, uh, by their genealogy. Okay, well, they're, they're, God isn't racist. And again, I have to tell you that this... Canaanite reference here is to a moral quality, not a racist quality. Well, it, it seems to me like you're putting your little spin uh, on the you, interpretation. In other words, you're going you're gonna to fluff it up and make it sound good, but it says that, that this race of people, these Canaanites, will not be in the house of God in the, in the latter days. They won't be in the latter day millennial. Did you know temple, the Canaanites so, oh. are Caucasian? What's that? The Canaanites were Caucasian. 
Did you know that? Oh, well, I, I don't know. You tell well, me. Well, they were. Canaanites were Caucasian. They were not black. And therefore, well, I, the I... The people in the Near East are a mixed people. Well, I mean, the they're, Canaanites they're mixture, back in the, the time Negro, of Abraham... The Oriental. You, Tobias, you would need to do your study on the Canaanites in the Bible. You just can't lift one verse and do a, a total biblical doctrine based on that one verse. We're getting low on time, so I'm going to have to uh, cut you off right now. So we enjoy your call, and thank you very much. I'm feeling cut off. Uh-huh. Thank you. Good night. <laughs> okay, we have an offline comment, Norma from Salt Lakes. Um, she wants to tell Michael and Elaine to watch Sean on Tuesday. He will help you. And I think you do watch Sean <laughs> on Tuesday, Sean. don't you? We're getting to the end of our time now. And again, we didn't get to all of our questions, but we do thank Elaine for being here. And you have had some, some good insights into your life and polygamy, but we didn't get it all in. <laughs> so um, we, we do want to thank every one of you for joining us tonight. And uh, a reminder to our viewers that Salvation begins and ends only with Jesus Christ. It is a gift. It's a gift from God. It comes because Jesus died on the cross for your sins. And we just ask you uh, to take the gift. Take it tonight. All you have to do is talk to Jesus and tell Him that you want His gift of eternal life. Repent from your sins and uh, acknowledge that He alone is the Savior. There's nothing you can do to earn it. Jesus said in Matthew 11, To come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me, on you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. That light burden is uh, not a list of do's and don'ts of what you must do to get into heaven. Polygamy is not part of it. A baby a year is not part of it. Living the United Order is not part of it. It's all and only Jesus Christ. Next week we're going to have the panel discussion and we'll be discussing and comparing the plan of salvation and other dogmatics of folks from a polygamy group, a Mormon group, and a Christian. And we're going to discuss this and other different doctrines from these religions. It should be an interesting time of comparing religious doctrine. And we hope that you will be here and join us and call in and ask your questions and learn more about the different doctrines, especially the doctrine of salvation as written in the Bible by Jesus Christ. You have a standing invitation to join us. Thank you and good night.